We are releasing thousands of snails on this small remote island in the middle of the ocean. And that is a really strange thing to do, of course. So strange that one of our biologists even ended up on the news to try to explain it all. But what really makes this special is that when we started this project, these snails were so neglected, so critically endangered that there were, in some cases, less than a dozen left for us to find in what was left of their devastated habitat. Starving, hunted by invasives, and about to go extinct. But that is where we came in. And together, this brilliant team set out to solve the problem. And today is the culmination of that effort. We have worked almost four years for this moment, and today this little snail and hundreds of its friends will be completing their journey from the brink of extinction really, and just return to the wild. And in this video today, we are here to tell you the story of this rescue. All the expeditions searching for these snails, the breeding programs at the zoos, and of course, the big moment of their return in force, and if I may say, in style, to live in the wilds of their native island once more. Now, the first question people always ask is... To many people, snails are just a garden pest. Why are these snails on a remote island in the middle of the ocean so important? Well, like um, all species, um, they, they have a role to play in the ecosystem. And they're also uh, an important part of uh, biodiversity that I think is worth protecting in its own uh, right. So I think they have, uh, you can say they have intrinsic value as well. Um, and if you look at uh, extinction rates um, in the animal kingdom, actually a lot of extinctions are happening uh, in species like these, these land snails in, in, in islands, even though people are, are not aware of this. Yeah, I'm sorry. It isn't every day that we end up on the news. So... I want to milk it a bit. But the key points that Tiago mentioned there is a good start for our story because nothing is going extinct quite like these snails. You see, if you look at all recorded animal extinctions over the past five centuries, about 53% of them are mollusks. And among this group, 71% of extinctions are terrestrial and freshwater mollusks on oceanic islands. That is really bad news if you're a snail on an oceanic island. And we can trace some of this vulnerability that they have to their evolution on these islands. Snails that got here stuck on a bird or floating on some wood actually found that they had very few predators and many habitats to choose from, so they evolved fewer defensive traits against potential predators. After all, why worry when there are so few around? They're also not the best at moving around, and so they ended up having small ranges and specializing to take advantage of specific habitats that the island had to offer. All of this means that they are particularly vulnerable to new predators and to habitat loss. And these poor guys got hit with a pretty bad combo. Humans cut their forests and rabbits and ghosts destroyed much of the rest of the vegetation. And then to make matters worse, when times are tough and the rats have no water to drink, well, they turn to snail smoothie to stay alive. And that is what happened here, which left our four protagonists, Jumitra Kuronla, Dishkula Leiliana, Jumitra Grabamai and Atlantica Kalatoids in a really tough spot, to the point where they were all thought to be extinct. That is, until they were rediscovered, after 100 years without a sighting, by a wonderful ranger and naturalist called Isamberto, who alerted Dinart, a malacologist. Together, they learned more about the snails and realized something needed to be done, which is how a coalition came to be formed between IFCN, Mossy Earth, Chester, Bristol, and Beauval Zoos, the Fellowship of the Snails. The first goal of this team was to organize an expedition to locate the four populations and then to secure enough snails to breed them in captivity. We started off by searching for Geometria Grabamai in the last known location where they were spotted, on this patch here, on the eastern side of the island. I'm here in Fajan Grand, which is where we came to look for Geometria Grabani. It's this tiny snail species that can be found nowhere else on Earth except for this tiny patch here uh, in Zerta Grand. We have at least three to four hours searching in this area. This is a big area, although although small in this tiny island, but it's a big area as far as land snails is concerned. So we hopefully will find our 15 to 20 specimens that will enable us to start our breeding, captive breeding program. And we were lucky to start with what turned out to be the easiest ones to find. So it's uh, associated with this uh, 
this fern which is found in this area and usually we find it here in the leaf litter and it's just this tiny little snail there in a few hours we found dozens of them so we had more than enough to take some with us which was a great start to this project then, the next day, we went searching for Diskla, on this slope here, in the center of the island, which was its last known location. So we're here searching for Diskla Liliana, and so far we've only found juveniles, they're quite hard to find, and they're only known from this patch of, of fern here. This search proved a lot tougher, and there were some bad signs here. Here you can see the bite marks of uh, domestic rats, uh, domestic mice, the mus musculus. Uh, the mice usually uses the snail as a, not as a food source, but mainly as a water source. Uh, since this is, we are entering in the dry season, in the summer season, they tend to be more voracious against the, the lion snails. The hours passed and things were not looking good. But then Isamberto, the ranger that originally rediscovered these snails to begin with, hit that mother load of snails. Hey. <laughs> that was two species in the bag. And the next day, full of confidence, we set out to find our third target of the trip, Atlantica calatoige which was last seen in the south of the island. Uh, this is a very steep descent. We, we know the population, it's only a tiny area, more or less 20 square meters. Uh, it's, it's probably below 60 to 80 meters from this area where we are standing on. Please take a moment to visualize just how little these snails have left. 25 square meters. There are bedrooms bigger than that. So we've been searching for Atlantica calatoids here for about three hours and all we got was two juveniles that are still alive and all the rest were dead shells. So it seems like um, yeah this population is really on the brink here and that means that there's not enough individuals for us to take with, with us for the captive breeding program. So on the final two days of the expedition, we tried to go for Geometra Kuronla, which was last found here on the western side of this ridge. And the path there was a lot harder. So we have just been dropped off this beach here by the boat. And uh, we're heading up to camp for one night in an area that's at the top. And this is the, the path we need to take to get there. So that's the valley we've just hiked with all the food and water. And just arriving at the shelter. They did a thorough search the next day, but found only two individuals, which they duly marked and left there to keep track of them in the future. As expected, it was really complicated, very, very difficult to find them. Uh, it is very, very dry at the moment, the soil. And the sensation that we have is that probably we are, we came too late in the season. So at the end of the first expedition, we managed to confirm the location and crucially, of course, the existence of all species, which is a big deal. But we also managed to collect enough individuals to start the breeding programs for Geometra Grabamai and Dishkla Lelian. On the next expedition, the team went straight to Atlantica to give it another try, and it quickly became clear that it was a different kind of day. You think set? The laugh says it all. That is another snail in the back. Nevertheless, the next few days, Geometra Kuronla still eluded us, as again, we only found two live individuals. But we kept going. On the next expedition, we found two of them again, so still not enough, and the real highlight of that trip was the rescue of a baby monk seal found stranded and alone. If you want to see that story, by the way, we've added it to our Field Notes channel, where we post regular on-the-ground updates from our various projects, including also an extended video about the first snail release you're about to see. And after this, more and more search expeditions followed, until finally, 
in 2023 on a fresh spring morning, we had them. That was two years of searching, often in challenging conditions. But to have this result, it was all worth it. Getting the snails is one thing. Once that part is done, a whole new operation begins. That is far from simple. Well, it was a little surprise, it was the number of founders. And that is the critical point. You know, say only just a few 20 individuals, you know, you can only put it in, just in your hand. This is what is left to be a part of the breeding program. And that, that is exciting, but as well as the most scary element part when you work in endangered species, like you have the pressure, this has to be safe. And despite having a lot of data from our various data loggers, figuring out what they need is also quite tricky. But the challenge is, is this the optimal habitat that the animals are living or that is the only one that is left? So sometimes we presume this is the ideal conditions and in fact it's that the animals are just hanging on the cliff, it's just saving, but this is not my habitat. And we don't know until you try. That involves different types of temperature, humidity, the diet, how you keep the animals, you will be exposed with plants, without plants, under the rocks, all the things you have to do with try and error. But you only have 20 in your bucket. And the team kept tweaking all of these parameters to a really, really detailed level. You can get a little we call her tunnel vision sometimes every day, you know, you go in, you check temperatures on a on a plastic probe, you're changing slices of sweet potato, everything's to because these snails are so precious, you know, they're critically endangered. We only had 23. We wanted to be really, really careful and precise with how we looked after them. So, you know, to the point where it was we have a protocol for how thinly we slice sweet potato and things like that. So when every day you're you're they're in a glass uh, viv that's this wide, we've got substrate that's this thin, we make sure the dimensions are right with the substrate, um, the ratio of sand to soil. But bit by bit, the results started to show. I mean, look at these beautiful tiny hatchlings. They are the cutest thing and when you know their background, it just makes it even more beautiful. When you start seeing the first success that the animals start breeding, see eggs, that's the biggest excitement, what we call sometimes the breed by luck. You needed to do it one more time. They say maybe it was just uh, without under control. So when you repeat it and you see these new clutches, then you start thinking, yeah, we get, we get on the tune. We, we, we get in the right condition that these animals start breeding. The populations fluctuated up and down throughout this process, but they kept growing and being stable enough to start considering some releases, which I think shows the real level of expertise and professionalism that the teams at the zoos displayed to be able to tackle such a difficult task. And by 2024, the numbers looked more like this. Now, that is a big difference. To kick off the reintroductions, we will be releasing Geometra Kronla and Dishkola Liliana, and the other species will follow in future releases. Before the snails were shipped to Madeira, the geometras were painted with a splash of UV reflective paint to make them easier to find at night when we go survey. And then the discos, which are bigger, also received a dot marking them with a different color for each release location. And when they arrived in Madeira, each one was fit with a little number so they can be tracked properly. And thus, fashionably dressed, they are ready to be released. Now, at this stage in the story, I always like to tell you about our Mossy Earth membership that funds this and all our other projects. But this time, before this big moment, I want to give the word to Dinart, who can best explain what you, our Mossy Earth members, have meant to him and his work. Sem o Mossy Earth, nós não estávamos na posição que nós estamos hoje em dia. Foram os primeiros a acreditar em nós, em boa verdade. Podem não ter essa sensação, mas uh, o facto de terem feito vídeos catapultou-nos para um espaço que nós não ocupávamos. E as pessoas começaram a perceber que existem caracóis, que existem pessoas disponíveis para trabalhar com caracóis uh, em áreas remotas, de difícil acesso e que estão a tentar de alguma forma uh, ajudar uh, estas espécies que estão criticamente em perigo. I think what Dinart says here is key. It is true that we contributed a reliable and steady stream of funding to this project, but I think that the biggest gift that you, our members, offered this project was simply an open mind. And so now is the moment we will be releasing these snails into nature 
And it's just very exciting for me. To me, this, this highlights how we have a community of people who also care about things that are perhaps not the most sexy, perhaps not the most appealing, but are just very impactful, that we have these unique projects that tackle forgotten and neglected issues. And so it's only because of our Mossy Earth members that we're able to, to focus on these things. So if you're not yet a member, please consider becoming one at mossy.earth. The reintroduction sites we picked were here, in Bougiou, the smaller island to the south. And we did so because, from the fossil record, we know that the snails existed here in the past, before going extinct, probably due to habitat loss due to invasives. However, as this island is smaller, the rangers managed to get it cleared of invasives, and the vegetation has improved greatly. So here you can see what a difference it makes to remove and eradicate the goats. So on this island, after the goats were removed, all this vegetation started to come back. And if you put your hand in the soil here, it's amazing, it's quite wet. And that just goes to show uh, how different the conditions are here. And it's why we hope that the snails will have a better time adjusting to this area than to Zerta Grande, where invasives are still a big problem. All the partners for this project managed to join for this first release, but we also had a new face join the team. His name is Umberto, and he will be the one coming here every month over the next few years to monitor these released populations. And his inclusion is also a big moment, because he is the son of Isenberto, the naturalist ranger who started all of this with his curiosity. It's the passing of the torch to a new generation, which is really important for the longevity of this work. So after arriving in Bougiou and doing a bit of scouting, the team set up camp and prepared for the first release, which was done just after nightfall. So we are finally releasing the snails here. Uh, it's pretty incredible after so many years uh, searching for them, uh, then all the teams growing them uh, in captivity. And now here we are, uh, it's a pretty crazy scene. Uh, red head torches so that we don't disturb the endemic birds that nest on this island and we have the UV lights out so that we can easily spot the snails uh, after we've released them. And uh, yeah, it's just very exciting finally seeing them uh, getting out uh, into their habitat. So the Discula leiliana, we're trying to place them under the rocks, that's where uh, the habitat we find them in, in Zerta Grande. And Geometra, we're taking particular care to put them where there's some organic matter, because we always find it um, in the middle of this sort of dead uh, um, plant leaves and, and things like that. So yeah, it's very exciting and we're finally getting the snails out in the wild. Seeing this imagery is surreal for me, because much like you, our Mossy Earth members, I have never set a foot on this island, as Tiago did all the filming, and I have never seen one of these snails in person, but I still feel such a close connection with their journey and the work that it took to get them here. It just puts a huge smile on my face to see these surreal neon-colored images of their return to the wild. It's an appropriately dazzling environment, a spectacular setting for what is in fact a really beautiful and important moment. So now after a reasonable night's sleep and just before the, the sun gets up, uh, we're heading out to check on the snails we released last night, uh, just to see how they're doing. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll take this opportunity just to, to have a check-in uh, before we head down. And bit by bit, as the sun started rising, the team found them going about their new life, slowly exploring the cracks and crevices of their new home, bringing hope wherever they went that this place might continue to enjoy their beautiful presence for centuries to come. And that is something you can be very proud of achieving. Until next time. Cheers!